Thank you so much for coming out tonight in this weather. I hope you had better luck with your windshield wipers than I did. I went to one of those Jiffy Lube places and they, I wasn't sure that they needed to replace my windshield wipers, but they did and then they fell off. So, <laughs> so much for the convenience. Um, anyway, so hopefully none of you had that experience tonight. Um, I want to do, I really do want to welcome you to our new year and here at Countryside and thank you all for being here this evening. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Kelly Keller and I direct the Center for Faith Studies and uh, work with the adult ed portion here at Countryside. And um, tonight we are very blessed to, well, first off I want to thank Jeremy who's making the yummy coffee. And Ed, who made sure we had snacks out here. So, uh, and if you prefer yucky coffee, there is yucky coffee back there too, and there's water. Um, so, anyway, I am, uh, what I've been doing with Wednesday Night Alive is starting us off, just kind of bringing us into the room um, with some meditation and a reading um, from scripture uh, read by our lovely assistant, Tracy Halverson. Um, and so we're going to do that just to bring us into the space. Um, and then I will introduce our speaker tonight. So if you would just, if you feel comfortable closing your eyes, to so just take a few deep breaths. So breathe in. And breathe out. Breathe in the blessing of being here this evening. And breathe out the troubles of the day. And breathe in. And breathe out. And here is the word of God. From the book of Matthew, chapter 2. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at, at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the, the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For, you shall, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so I may go also and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. I thought that was an appropriate reading since today is the Feast of the Epiphany. <coughs> and then I bet, and then it was like, well, how do I segue into Derek Miller with this? <laughs> so, Derek, you this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Derek is going to talk eloquently about this. But what I think it has to do, there's a little travel piece there, so transportation planning. <laughs> 
you know, the road, getting people on the road. Um, I don't know, or it could be the inclusive piece of, you know, what kid wants incense and myrrh? And, you know, if you're going, oh, no, you know, we, we think more about what people really need. Um, or maybe another piece, and this is actually somewhat serious, is that he is navigating the halls of power, and that sometimes uh, he does have to uh, use the system and use his treasure chest to bring good through whatever means are available to him. And so he has been committed to doing that. I had somebody tell me that he does not have an easy job, but that they admire him greatly for the way he does his job. So I think that's a good segue of the scripture. So please help me um, introduce, or uh, welcome Claire. No? Thank you. Just so you're uh, fully, a full disclaimer, I'm I'm not a city employee tonight, so the halls of leadership order, I can't remember, you just said that. Um, they might be listening. Um, I'm a countryside church member. Um, when I uh, go out and talk to groups, I talk and I say I'm a city planner, and I think my kids understand it the most, more than my parents do what I do. <laughs> and um, I tell people where to put buildings. That's what I do. That's what Eli says. So, but I found this online. This pretty much is what I do. So it's really hard to talk about city planning, explain what it is. I solve problems you don't know you have and ways you can't understand, which is very true. Um, I started in my career as a city planner, but I'm a transportation planner now, so I work at the intersection of land use and transportation. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Not everyone gets that. Um, so I called my uh, talk tonight inclusive mobility. I'm going to pick on you guys right now. And feel free to talk anytime and ask me questions as I go through this. Does anyone want to take a stab at what, what inclusive mobility is? Mass transit. All forms of transportation. Pedestrian, uh, bike, and car. She knows. She knows more bike. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, what how I how I put it, it's people centered. Um, prior to the 1950s, that's what mobility was in America, and it's still that way, very much so in, in Europe. Um, the mayor of uh, Bogota, Colombia. This is his quote, and I'm gonna share a lot of quotes. So I apologize, but. Basically, a developed country is a, is a place where the poor, uh, or is not a place where the poor have cars, but where the rich ride transit. That's, and um, Enrique Pinoza um, was an amazing mayor. And um, I'm talking about some of the projects um, that are coming to Omaha that he first started in the world. Um, and it, what's the purpose of cities? Basically, to bring people together, uh, exchange goods, friendship, culture knowledge and minimize travel, where transport is to maximize that exchange. That's pretty important. Um, this is a great quote, it's kind of hard to see. If you plan cities for cars and traffic, you get cars and traffic. If you plan for people and places, you get people and places. Mm -hmm. And we're with the digital age, everyone being on the internet and everything else, it's all about great places. And that's pretty much what my talk is about tonight, but it's about uh, transportation as well. And Fred Kent, he was he started Project for Public Spaces. If you're interested in public spaces, uh, Google that. It's a great website. They do great work in New York City and all over the country. This is my great-grandfather, um, and that's my grandma. That's on the, the, the left there. She's the short one. <laughs> he was in advertising back in before the Depression, during the Depression, after the Depression. So he had a tough job as well. Imagine trying to be in advertising during the Depression. But when I think about him, and I think about him a lot, I think about <coughs> I'd like to go back in time. Um, the date's incorrect there. Um, and if you didn't know, Back to the Future was last October. Um, this is his time where he was in his prime of his life. There's a streetcar there south, uh, 10th Street, and that's the Burlington Station and um, Union Station on the, on the north side of the street there. But as a transportation planner, this is the time that um, I would be most excited about in America. We haven't quite making, taken that turn towards more suburban style lifestyles. And um, there are streetcars. We had over 100 miles of streetcar tracks in Omaha at one point in time. And you could really see east of 60th Street in Omaha where those streetcars went. The roads are wider. There's nodes like 36th and Center, um, Benson, not Benson, uh, Dundee, um, and other areas, the Flatiron District, or uh, yeah, uh, uh, Blackstone District. Um, all those areas were served by streetcars. 
at one point in time or another. So this would be, a, for me, one of the times I'd like to go back to. And then in the 1950s, and you could draw your own conclusions by this slide, uh, what's going on here. Um, but 1950s is actually in Kansas, the state of Kansas, where the first interstate, where our interstate system was started. And that pretty much started our direction to where we are today. This is what was envisioned back in during Eisenhower. It wasn't really Eisenhower's Truman, even though it's called the Eisenhower Expressway System. It's Truman. Um, so we started with this, and we got that. And it's even more than that today, um, because federal monies don't only pay for interstate systems, they also pay for a lot of our roads. Um, if you look at um, our, our street network in any city, it's, it's a bone structure. Um, it's not a nervous system, but a bone structure. But on the left side, uh, it's Charleston. Um, and on the right side, I forget where that's at, but that could be anywhere, suburban America. Um, and in this picture, on this side, you, can, you know where all the traffic is. You know where all the car traffic is. It's where those two major roads meet. In Omaha, we do have a good system east of 72nd Street, and then between 72nd and 108th, it's it's a uh, it's a weird place. That's where we are right now, I guess, but it's a weird place as far as streets. Um, and then west of 120th, that you pretty much have the major grid system. And this is pretty important. I'll come back to this. Um, so our, our traditional approach in suburban America and the way we deal with transportation these days, especially in the Midwest, with um, not great transit systems. Uh, if we get more cars, we either add more lanes of traffic or we add more roads. That's pretty much how we handle it. So we anticipate what the land use, what development's going to be, we forecast it, and then we accommodate it through adding road capacity. So um, this is a chart basically showing um, capacity of the road network. And there's this thing called induced traffic. So anytime you open up uh, a new roadway, or add roads to an existing system, you're basically inducing traffic. Um, here's a county road, just an example of what it, what it would look like as the area develops, it becomes that. So it goes on and on and on. So there's no way, in my opinion, in a lot of people's opinion, um, mostly planners, not engineers, um, <laughs> if we don't have any engineers in the room, um, um, there's no way to solve congestion. It's impossible. You can only manage it. And just last year, last November, California DOT figured this out. <laughs> and we've seen, this is one of the nicer interstates in California. There's some that are like 20 lanes uh, wide, um, but they finally figured it out. You can't solve congestion. You can only manage it. This is downtown um, Atlanta. And um, you see the signs above there. Basically, it, it connects to the interstate system. But really, what that says is big road, drive fast. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is anywhere USA as well, but I don't know if you can, anyone can point out the pedestrians in this picture. They're, oh, they're yeah. endangered species, oh, yes. um, but they're there. But basically what, what this gets at is the character of the street sets the character of the community, sets the context of what that community is like. Everyone's fighting for advertising space with all the pole signs. Uh, more and more roads. That's a six lane, seven lane arterial street. So it's pretty much what you put in, how you design your street is the community that you'll get. Omaha, we have a similar um, situation. A great example I love to use. 114th and Dodge is this prior expressway. So everyone complained, and this is more of a land use mistake than a than transportation mistake because of Old Mill. But this is what it used to look like in the 90s, and you can tell by the style of cars and license plates. So what did we do? And the state told us to do this. We spent $120 million on the expressway. And I remember I heard one lady say, oh, we're finally a big metropolitan city. We're a great city now. We have an elevated expressway. But she forgot we have 480 downtown that's also elevated. <laughs> so I, mean, I was even excited about this. I mean, Sarah go out there. And I said, we got to go drive on this thing. It's going to be great. <laughs> so we get out there. Um, and so we open it. And the first, uh, and I'll, I'll say AM or PM peak, those are the busy times of the day where we have lots of car traffic. Because a lot of people, you know, a lot of people don't walk to work. Um, they, they live uh, further away from work. So there's a lot of driving in the AM peak and the PM peak, 8, 8 AM and 5 PM. So we were all proud to open this up, spent $120 million. And what happened? That's what happened. So, and that happens every day. Um, and, the, and the Department of Roads, that's who can, uh, controls our interstate system in Nebraska. We're the only Department of Roads in the country. 
Um, they wanted to make it four lanes wide, so we thought and we said we should make it six lanes wide, so we made it six lanes wide and we still get this. Another aspect of being car centric, um, and a lot of communities are this way, a lot of communities are changing, is that parking is the boss. And that's unfortunate, because we have scenes like this all throughout America. Um, and we design our lifestyle, we design our buildings around cars and car storage. I like to call it car storage, that sounds more impactful. Um, so, take you back in time again, this is downtown Omaha, 1941. We have a couple off-street parking um, uh, lots, and most of it's on-street parking at that point in time. Not a lot of people had cars back then, but this is, the red indicates the, the off-street parking. And orange will show up here in a little bit, and that means parking garages. So 1941, look at the beautiful grid of streets, and um, the, the park north of Central uh, High School. Um, and I'm, I'm downtown at this point in time is about the same time that picture I showed you earlier. 1955, I added a few more um, parking lots. The Civic was built. 1965, more parking. 76, 76 was right after the Friday went in, connecting to Council Bluffs. 85, 93, 2001, 2007, 2013. So if you see downtown there, and a lot of people say there's no parking downtown, it's terrible. You can't park anywhere. Like, no, there's no parking in the old market, and it's free. Um, so what I was talking about before is that we actually physically design, architects and structural engineers design our buildings around parking. And to me, that's amazing. Um, and right now in downtown, there's a big fight going on about parking, beautiful old buildings. And what I, what I tell people in downtown and midtown, uh, the, the parking problem is it's the problem that it's going to limit our development. And it's um, because everyone thinks they need to have four parking stalls per person. That's about what we have today in downtown, three to four parking stalls per person, because you don't actually go, the way you get to your next parking stall is by driving. So if you work downtown, you go to a restaurant after work, you drive there, go to a train game after that, you drive there, and then if you go get a drink after the game, you drive there too, so you need four, three to four parking stalls. So HDR is going downtown, actually on this lot right here, a major um, engineering architecture firm that gets this stuff, that gets great places, and they still need a lot of parking, they think. Um, so they are gonna build a lot of parking with their building, and then a lot of off-street parking for their building. Um, so in my mind, and what we've been telling people is that parking downtown to uh, truly limits our full development potential. And then there's the aspect of money, of the way we are today. Um, took this the other night, that's pretty proud, dollar sixty. I think we've got to our dollar twenty-eight, um, which is pretty amazing. But a lot of people think when you go fill up your car with gas, you pay taxes, you pay your wheel taxes, and that's how the system works. That's how I pay to get around. Uh, that's how I have the right to drive my car because I pay for the system. And, well, that's really not the truth, um, and I'll get to that in, in a minute here. But 2004, 2007. 2014, we did three separate studies on, this is just roads and doesn't include maintenance, but 11 years ago it was about $280 million behind in infrastructure, and you can really tell this out west um, with our arterial street network out there, and this is just roads. Um, 2007 went up to 325, and then uh, last year, not last year now, um, 2014 we're about $500 million behind. And then to fully build out our, our arterial street network, it's a, we need another $1.5 billion. The problem is, is that a lot of the funding that you pay, because you, you do pay taxes when you get gas and when you buy cars and pay wheel tax, but the gas tax hasn't been increased since that guy was president. And I think things are more expensive these days than he was uh, president. All the money that is taken in by gas stations is then put into the Highway Trust Fund, which has gone broke five times in the last eight years. And it's been had to, it had to um, be funneled in with new dollars from the general fund, which to me is a big deal because the system's not working. Just the way we get around is not working. The way we fund our transportation system, it's not working. So we have to do it differently. Um, and also, our system's falling apart. This is Omaha. Uh, I think it's 16th, and I forget exactly where that was at, but this is a real sinkhole. Um, there's a lot of other places um, that this has happened. This actually happened 15 years ago at 78th and Pacific, uh, not this size, 
but our bridges are falling down. Minneapolis happened, that was more of a construction issue, but our roads are in horrible shape. Um, a lot of our transit systems around the country, like the L, is in horrible shape. So things have to change. Unfortunately, there's this a low of the automobile. And I, I would say I love the automobile, too. I don't hate cars. We own two. Um, I've owned a lot, 10 or 12 in my lifetime. But who can't, who doesn't, I mean, Montana, Sahara, Malibu, Safari Escape Expedition. You know, you got to love cars, Expedition, or Explorer, Pathfinder. Um, and all those. And plus transit, you know, it's for creeps and weirdos. That's a real ad by GM. And I know a lot of people think this because it's been said in meetings before, because um, it's just for those people. Well, I, someday in Omaha it'll be for everyone. And also people complain the bus really doesn't go anywhere. Um, that's not real, that was made up. Um, um, and then also, anytime we talk about, and I worked for the city for 10 years in, in this role, but anytime we talk about bikes and the road, people get very upset. Um, that all, when the World Herald does an article about riding your bike, bike lanes or anything like that, it's polarizing. Um, and I don't know why. It's, and even there's, there's a movie that just came out last year called Cars versus Bikes, I think, and it, it kind of missed the point. But um, that, a lot of people, think that, and it's unfortunate because bikes don't pay their way. Well, they do. Um, and some cyclists on Maha want this to happen. This is an automobile lane, not a bike lane. <laughs> <laughs> not real. It's, it's, it's Canada, Seattle, so especially not real Canada, Seattle. <laughs> uh, another idea is where, you know, roads, that's a good investment. And it is definitely a conservative versus liberal issue. Um, but if you think about it, conservatives should love transit. They should absolutely love it because it, it only it fits right in their wheelhouse. The problem is, is the conservatives have that suburban lifestyle, and that's what they want to hold on to. And anytime we talk about transit, streetcars, and things, and bike lanes, it it it, it, it um, is taken away from their lifestyle. Um, and of course, um, I almost didn't show this because we're in church, but no, I, I had to. Um, so that love of cars. Um, and then there's a marathon gas commercial on right now. I'm talking about American spirit. And it got me really excited. I want to go drive. I want to go get in our, our van and go drive around a while after I saw that commercial. Um, and it, it truly is mobility and not just cars. It's, it's, it's freedom, the American way. You know, it's, it's all those things. Um, but if you picture this, if you think about mobility as an elevator, um, and some people push the button, the door opens up right away, you get on and then you go. Um, other people that, and it's about 30 to 35 percent of the people in any community across the country, if they push that button, they've got to wait hours. It's those people that can't drive, that are too old to drive, too young to drive, are handicapped. Um, mobility for them, it's, it's a horrible thing. And so that's really what inclusive mobility is about, is allowing everyone to have access to our community. So, as uh, Einstein said, we, we have to think differently um, in, in, in how we do things in the future. And to me, it's more about choice. And when we have these conversations, when I spoke about multimodal transportation, I have to choose my words wisely, and it's all about choice and mobility, and getting the mobility right, um, getting the street right, the, the street design right. Um, so, this is a new way of thinking about how we design our transportation system, <coughs> we design the street first, that'll handle the travel and that'll influence the land use. And that's really the, the point of everything I do right now is to get our transportation system to create the community that we want to have in the future. And it's about expanding choices, not just one choice. And um, over the years, I've educated some of our engineers at City Hall and they used to say, you're forcing people on bikes, you're forcing people to put spandex on and get on their bikes. And like, <laughs> some people I want to see in spandex, but um, <laughs> Truly in Omaha, we force people into cars. Um, when I lived at 38th and Farnham, my insurance was high, and it wasn't because of theft. It was because of insurance. And a lot of people that go buy a car, get fake insurance or whatever, get, and, and basically, or get insurance and then drop it. And that's why a lot of insurance rates are high in parts of our community, because people don't have insurance. Um, but anyway, expanding our, 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 our choices. Um, the capacity of our streets, a lot of our streets can handle bike lanes, transit lanes, and other things. We just need to think differently. So this kind of gets at that adding, uh, instead of adding more lanes and more roads, uh, we're moving people. 
um, improve the quality of travel, um, get people to possibly uh, work closer to home or move closer to their work, and then we manage not solve congestion. Um, so when you have land uses like this, and this is there are some places in West Omaha like this where we segregate, and this is partly in fault to planners, we started segregating uses and not connecting areas. And this actually happened is happening at Sterling Ridge. We lost a connectivity issue out there where our new church is going. Um, that creates big roads. So you have all these people that have to drive out of their way to get to where they want to go. Or if you have a more connected community, like I showed you earlier, and that's some bone structure of our streets, um, you don't have to go on the big roads. You can stay internally and, and get to go get going where you want to go quicker. Eric, what, is that, what do you mean by that, where we lost the connectivity? Um, the real quickly on Sterling Ridge, um, that was a golf course, but back in the day, some wise people actually made some street connections on the south side of the golf course and on the, west, on the east side of the golf course. And unfortunately, we didn't pave it, so it looked like it was somebody's yard. And so we wanted to connect those roads because we like these, we like connectivity. And first of all, I don't think the neighbors wanted Sterling Ridge to happen. Secondly, they didn't want connections from a new sub, a new development into their old, into their existing development. So they fought us on that, and it's pretty easy because the developers like, I, I don't care, I could put the develop, I put the connection in or not. Um, usually, I'll side with the neighbors. The neighbors didn't want it. The neighbors paid eighty to hundred thousand dollars to fight it um, through a PR firm, and so we lost those connections. We did gain some pedestrian connection, uh, a connection to the south. There's a great trail that runs that'll be that's east of our site. Um, that was supposed to be a street, but we got a, a pedestrian connection. So um, there's supposed to be another one on the east side. There's some to, to bog, uh, topographic issues, um, but we still could have put it in, um, but we lost that one altogether. And it, for me, it was a big deal because there's a school right there. So there's new houses, um, and I don't know what else is going to go in there. There's, some, there's a piece of the property that hasn't been designated yet, but there's a bunch of houses there. If the kids go to school, um, hopefully they walk, then they can just walk through the neighborhood. If, they, if their parents have to drive them, then they have to go out onto to Pacific, onto 132nd, and then turn into the neighborhood and then drive all the way back to the school. So that's what I meant by those lost connections. That happens all the time, um, because politically the leadership, either city council or the mayor, it's not a big issue for them. They don't quite understand it, so it's like, let's well, not make the neighbors mad. So this is, this is an example on the left of a fully connected neighborhood, and that's a lot of East Omaha. Uh, east of 72nd Street where we have those connections. And when we have that, that bone structure of our grid of streets, um, they basically, through uh, design, you can have the same capacity if you have a grid of streets versus two major arterial streets. And this, the, the right safer, uh, the, the right adds redundancy, adds more routes, it's more walkable. Um, so there's a, there's a whole lot of advantages on the right side. I um, already talked about that. Um, so some of the, um, even the perception out there, when people are asking, I love this slide, and I'm sure people do this. I haven't done it yet, I don't have a dog yet. Um, but most people out there, when surveyed, they want walkability. Um, AARP, interestingly enough, and APA, American Planning Association, both did surveys last year, or 2014 to get that straight. Um, and ARP, they're very interested in this idea of walkability because um, seniors, they want a walkable areas plus, um, like Sarah's grandma, we had to take the keys away. Um, they want to have walkability because at some point in time in life, you can't drive anymore. So a lot of them basically said they want to be close to a grocery store and parks and and have a bus stop was the top one. Um, when At the APA, they, they um, uh, surveyed millennials and then they also surveyed, um, what do they call them, active boomers. That's a new name for boomers to make them feel better, I guess, active boomers. <laughs> so um, basically, two-thirds basically said they want schools, transportation uh, play, um, choices, walkable areas. Um, again, the same thing, walkable communities. Um, and they also said the best way to grow the economy is to have walkable communities. Finally, and this is one of the drivers, besides the automobile industry, the, the other major driver that decides pretty much how our, our communities are developed are the development, is the development community. And this is a national publication that came out last year, and they're getting on the bandwagon now, too. They used to be against um, 
trails. But now, over the last 15 years, they understand why uh, trails are important. It's an amenity. So this is also an amenity. So hopefully, we'll see more developers uh, jump on this bandwagon. Then locally, we did surveys for a, a regional plan that we did. Um, people even locally, uh, reducing traffic congestion, improving transportation options, um, bike to neighborhood stores, business schools, walkability, more public transit options. Um, to touch on the point of uh, sustainability and climate change. Peter Calthorpe wrote a book a few years ago, and he, in his book, basically says the best way to solve climate change is through community design, better community design. Um, you can put all the solar farms out there, wind farms, but the best way and the only way he thinks is to is to design better communities. Again, about choice. So in Omaha, real quickly, and I'll wrap up here. Um, We've been working on this for a long time. There's been many stories about this. What we've, uh, through generous philanthropic support, and this doesn't happen. Uh, Omaha is very, as we all know, I, I think we all know, our philanthropic community in Omaha is just awesome, and they help kick this off. We wouldn't be here without them. So we got most of this system complete. It's either bike lanes or sharrows. I don't like sharrows, but bike lanes, it's a striped white line with a bike symbol, and it's a bike lane that you ride in with your bike. Sharrows, it's just a designated street for a bike. Uh, that you, the car has to share the, the roadway with the bike. Uh, but most of these are bike lanes. Um, and the next few slides here basically shows you what we can do to streets with great street design. These are opportunities. There's always opportunities in many areas of our community, but uh, most of these pictures I show you um, won't happen until unless we find more funding. Um, so this is Dodge Street Expressway um, above there and lower Dodge, and since we have the expressway, we can start cutting up Dodge and making intersections on the lower side. So this is what that, that area can become, because it's becoming about the age where it can be redeveloped, so we can connect north and south to Dodge. So, and again, this is just giving an idea of what we can do. 30th Street, uh, North 30th Street, um, 30th and Ames about, this used to be, 30th Street used to be Highway 75 before we built Highway 75, so there's a lot of extra capacity. When I mean extra capacity, we could uh, basically take two or three lanes of traffic out of the street and the cars would still make it through fine. Um, so this is what we can do, could do, and we're actually gonna do um, along the lines with the purpose-built communities with what Buffett's doing on North 30th Street, start to do things like this. And I always laugh because a tax sign always stays there. I should never remember <laughs> the tax sign. Uh, South 13th Street, Great Street. It's got great bones. Um, <laughs> Um, and some guy lives down there. Um, <laughs> so not bike lanes, but this is what that area could become. And with all the development happening in downtown, midtown, south of there, we may see something similar to this. Um, and if we get more people that understand what streetscape um, differences can do to communities like Dundee and Benson, Florence, um, we may see more of this. A couple other projects that we're working on. Uh, on the bottom, I talked to about the mayor of, uh, of Bogota, Colombia. He did the first BRT. And what BRT is bus rapid transit. It's the closest thing you can have to light rail, but still be on rubber tires. It's um, a our, our um, um, two-vehicle um, uh, bus vehicle. And it has preferential treatment intersections. Uh, you can jump around traffic. It, um, usually, the best way to do it is to run it in its own guideway, its own traffic lane. Unfortunately, we can only do that downtown, so it'll run in mixed traffic, then at 72nd and 90th, basically be able to jump around cars. Um, so that's happening. Um, we got $15 million from the feds a couple years ago to do that project that'll open in 2018, and that'll connect West Roads to downtown, have about eight different stops, and the, the stops are not really stops, they're transit stations. When we first publicized this and put the figures out there, how much it's gonna cost, because it's about $34 million, if someone figured it out, the stations will cost us about $300,000. So people got really upset about that and wrote the mayor. The mayor, she responds to everything, unfortunately. And um, so basically, you have to make the investment in transit to change things. And like I said earlier, we need to get transportation to build the communities that we want to see in the future. And if you're going to spend $200 on a bus stop, that's not going to change our community. So. Uh, if you want to know more about that, I can talk more about that later. Um, the other idea is modern streetcar. Like I said, we had over 100 miles of streetcar tracks in Omaha at one point in time until 1954 when it all closed down. Um, we've been studying the idea for 
the city has been studying idea for 20 years. I've been studying it and working on it for 10. So maybe when our kids get in high school, we'll be able to write it. Um, they're really young right now. So um, <laughs> that's a joke. Um, we're close. We'll know by March or, or uh, April if we can do it. And a lot of people ask, you know, why, why not just run a bus? Well, in downtown, we've had a bus circulator, two of them, that have run around downtown for years. And they run on five minute headways, which means they come every five minutes. And you saw through the slides of parking that we keep adding parking. So it hasn't really affected parking. It hasn't brought more development to downtown. So the reason why we like streetcars are the rails. That basically says that that investment that we make as a community in, in streetcar, it'll always be there, it'll always be on the street. The best thing about buses is that you can move them. You can change the routes. The worst thing about buses is that you can move them. You can change routes. Mm -hmm. So as a developer, I'm not gonna invest in a, in a corridor that, that has a bus. I'll invest in a corridor that has light rail or streetcar. Um, the other big thing about streetcars is the economic development. Well, along the lines of that, is that they have a huge economic development potential. Um, here's the, um, the the mothership of I guess of streetcars. That's probably the wrong word. Um, Portland. They just completed. Um, they started it in 14 years ago, 2001, um, and and started the first modern streetcar in the country. There's a few cities like San Francisco that have always had. Uh, San, uh, New Orleans that have always had streetcars, but this is the first modern streetcar in the country. And last September, they opened a bridge that allows every mode of transportation except for cars. It's called the Tillicum Crossing. It's awesome. It's a cable state bridge, but that completed the loop for, for the Portland streetcar. And they've seen, I think, close to $3 billion because of that streetcar. Um, the other cool thing about Portland, they have an inclusionary housing ordinance in the Pearl District. Um, used to be a, a, I think it was an old shipping yard, and which means there's, um, it's not only a certain segment of the population, uh, so it, it has, uh, includes access for anyone to live there, which is really nice. So Portland was the poster child. I don't talk about Portland anymore because Portland's Portland. I have a slide that says keep Portland, Portland weird because the lines, they don't understand Portland. So Seattle, they um, have had a streetcar for quite a while now. Uh, Paul Allen invested in it. I think he actually bought one of the vehicles for them. Uh, Sacramento is still working on it. They had an initiative that failed. Um, Minneapolis is working on it. Milwaukee is happening. Um, M1 Rail, which is Detroit, um, they raised over $100 million <coughs> in philanthropic dollars for their streetcar. Um, DC, they're in operations, Atlanta. I have Tucson, a very successful case. So in Kansas City, they'll be opening in April with streetcar. And um, it basically connects the river market down to the um, Union Station. And I talk a lot about streetcars because um, that's one of my main projects right now. But in my mind, what streetcars can do is change the, the view of transit in Omaha. It'll, change, it'll, it'll be a game changer for Midtown and Downtown. And it'll do exactly what we need to do is basically get our transportation system to shape our community. Um, and again, um, it's all about quality of place. And going back to the whole internet technology thing, um, and one great example for that is um, students <coughs> these days that are graduating from high school, going to college, they can pick anywhere they want to go. Um, they can go online to school. And one of the biggest um, things that affects where most kids go to school these days is the what the university is like, the place it is. So. And also, one great thing about uh, millennials, attracting millennials, about quality of place and great places, um, that's how we can retain our, our talent here in Omaha. That's how we can attract new talent. So again, back to the whole quality of place. Um, and these are some great examples. I don't know if anyone recognizes what this is. It's exorbitant. Um, I was never, ever, ever, never able to see a, a horse race there. But today, this is kind of what it looks like. It's filled in a little bit more. It's all based upon a vision, um, and it basically has become a great place, one of our great places. It's kind of contrived. It's not like the um, old market. Another great place, again, it's not as um, great as the old market, but uh, Midtown Crossing, that was what it was meant to look like. That's what it came out to be. And it's a, a great place for people to gather. And this, even though you know 
purist and preservationist, and they're mad because we lost the learn, learn to page up here. Um, what this has done for Midtown has been extraordinary. It's probably had a huge ripple effect, over $500 million in investment and more on the surrounding area. Um, one last couple comments here. Um, so this was Omaha 1854 when we first incorporated. And the yellow is where we are today. Uh, the land mass is, is huge. And um, people often ask me, are we ever going to grow to Lincoln? Well, physically, maybe, but right now for years. But we can't. That black line you see is our boundary of how big our city can get. The green is what we have left. And we just completed a study. We have about 25 more years of growth if we continue at the pace that we've continued, that we've um, gone through the last 15 years. So we need to get this right. One problem is we're kind of ahead of the curve with this multimodal transportation business. Uh, a lot of cities don't realize they have an issue with um, mobility until after they've totally filled up. It's been easy for Kansas City to do streetcar and other things is because they don't have anywhere to grow. We do, but there is an endpoint. Um, there's a last frontier that we have to grow to. Um, there's, there's, there was an article uh, a few years ago talking about smoking, and um, you think about 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, we'd probably be, most of us would be sitting here smoking cigarettes and having a good conversation, but today that's unheard of. Um, in my mind, and I agree with this author that wrote the, that wrote the uh, article, um, the same goes for multimodal transportation. I think over time it'll catch on. Um, it will, it'll be unheard of that everyone drives a car, um, I hope, in the next 20, 25 years. Um, don't tell Mutual that I use this. Um, they sued Oprah. Um, uh, so basically what I, what I want you to take away from this is when you're traveling around Omaha, um, don't do it while you're driving me at a stoplight, but look around and um, maybe take a walk and check out your community because there's, uh, um, I want you to have a different perspective and maybe have that aha moment with transportation in the future. And it can be different. A lot of people think that this is what we have. Well, we have choices. We just didn't need to tell our leadership that we need to change. We want a different city. We want a city that's great in the future. Um, that's that. Um, so I think about the past, my grand great grandfather um, and the, the lifestyle he lived and the place that he was in. So I think we can merge that with what we have, what we have today. And, it doesn't that when, when the planners talk, the engineers all roll their eyes thinking all these planners want these Dundee type streets, these Underwood Avenue type streets everywhere, and that's not the case. I think we can mold them together. And I don't have the picture of the other one, but um, <laughs> for me and planning for our community, it's not so much about me, about you, it's about them. And hopefully they'll stick around um, in Omaha, but um, unless we change things, I don't think they'll, they'll like the, the place that they live in in the future. So. It's really about them and their kids and their kids beyond that. Um, and again, kind of want to leave you with this, this quote. And it's what we've been doing the last 40 to 50 years. It'll take a while to get back to something like this. But um, I think we can be different and um, uh, we can get around differently in the future. I think that's it. Yeah. So we went kind of long there. Questions? sharing services like Uber and Lyft. How does that influence what you do? I think it's good. It's um, I'm, I'm glad it, they finally accepted it here. I think they have accepted it here. I actually took it when I was in Seattle at a conference and um, they kind of made the cab companies mad, but actually that's good for them. It creates some, some competition. That's a good thing. Um, I, I would like to see more of that. Um, I was a little bit afraid of liability and risk. If something happens, how, how what happens then? Um, that kind of gets into something I didn't talk about, but there have been predictions made in the last few years that uh, along those lines, but autonom autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles will happen. You know, they're coming. Before, we thought we had to have the infrastructure in place to get them to work and actually have road infrastructure so the road can talk to the cars. You don't need that. Cars can talk to the cars. Cars can see things. The biggest problem for autonomous vehicles is that the human drivers screw them up. They did a test with a Google car at the intersection, and the Google car stopped and waited and did what you're supposed to, but all the human drivers kept coming up and then just going. So it confused the Google car, so it just sat there, and they didn't go anywhere. But I think autonomous vehicles, I think it's going to happen. I'm not sure what impact that'll have on. We'll still need transit. 
Uh, over and lift, um, I think that's a new form of a jitney. I don't know if you know what a jitney is. A jitney is a, a ride sharing system um, that we actually had. I don't know if they still have it today, but in North Omaha, the cabbies wouldn't go up there. So they created their own Uber and Lyft system. So on the cheap, so you give your neighbor a couple bucks, he takes you somewhere, and there's a, a guy that would drive around, take people places. So I think it's, it's just a new name for something that we've always had. So it's just a part of the system. We need all those components to, to fit. Um, in, our, in, our, in our city. What do you wish the public would do to lobby to make your job easier? Lobby? <laughs> <laughs> the problem is is that um, Omaha and we have Nebraska nice and we have, if everyone feels comfortable, they don't say anything. It's just that if they like something in Omaha, if we like something in Omaha, we don't say anything. If we um, don't like something, we do say something. And um, Unfortunately, we're mostly uh, returning. I don't know, maybe we're purple now, but mostly depends on the leadership that's in, in on the third floor. That's the mayor's office on where they are with things. Um, I, I would just there's a great book called um, I think it's called Meeting of the Minds, basically about conservatives and um, uh, transport and transit. And I think I wish more people to understand the benefits to it. Um, so I think what the public can do is just see know that they have a role in our future in Omaha and get involved and get engaged. Don't get engaged when your neighbor does something um, on his lot next to your house, because that's usually only people when, only time people get involved in Omaha. It's, it's something's happening in my backyard, like Stirling the Ridge, like um, our new campus out there. People want to get involved when it, it's a, when it impacts them. And I think people just accept that this is how it's going to be. I don't have a place in this. But I think I've seen it change over the last five years. More and more people are getting involved and that's what, that's what we need. Um, unfortunately, during the last election, my department took a beating from the, from, during the mayor's race, and we lost a lot of credibility, and it, wasn't, it was not deserved at all. Um, so I think but one of the biggest things that I want to do is see more discussions around city planning, community planning, in our community and the importance of it, so then people can get behind these ideals, these ide uh, ideas, and, um, and lobby. So I think that's the biggest thing, is just be engaged and active. There, several years ago, you cited a study, I think, to me, that I wanted you to refresh my memory on. It was something like, there was a study that had been done, like, if people say they're, on public amenities what they're willing to pay for and what they're not, and you put together a city based on what they're willing to pay for, they actually don't want to live in that city. <laughs> yeah. Is that, is that is that right? Is that accurate? Basically, that you end up if you pay for what you're comfortable paying for, oh. you end up with a city that actually doesn't have the amenities that you would not choose right. to live in that city. Right. And so, I think there's a distortion out there of what people pay in taxes and what they what they get back. Um, so you're exactly right. So I think um, people are only willing to pay so much, and um, it's the cities that invest in things that have their great the great places. So in Omaha, we're not, we're not, our appetite for investing in public infrastructure is not great. One of the worst things right now is our sewer separation project. We're spending $1.5 billion on that. Our sewer bills have gone through the roof. Mm -hmm. So we don't have much of an appetite to, to, to spend on like crazy things like streetcars um, or bike lanes and things like that. And I don't think people truly understand what they actually pay the city. I think when people see their tax bill, say it's five thousand dollars, they think forty nine hundred goes to the city. Well, forty five hundred goes to the school district, and the city gets about five hundred. Um, so you're you're exactly right. So I think if um, people would draw out a picture of their ideal city, and then we put we would put uh, numbers to it, I don't think they'd pay for it. So that's that's a big problem right now. talked about like HDR moving down and kind of you know with all of the knowledge they have I mean it seems like there's also a role for those corporate entities to kind of you know build that path or set that stage and I mean do you see other corporate entities around Omaha who are doing that or I mean I don't know how that political yeah, works that. but you think HDR would get it. They, they did a downtown plan. They, they've been working on our streetcar project. But I think when it came for them to spend, they're going to spend $100 million on that building. So when it came to them, and they're employee owned, and I think 90% of the employees didn't want to come downtown. <laughs> but we worked on them for two years. So you're a corporate, or you're a world headquarters, you don't belong in suburbia, you belong in downtown. 
So when it came time for them to choose, it was really tough for them because first their employees didn't want to go downtown and their employee owned and um, they promised everyone a parking space. Which it's, how many parking spaces? 1,100 parking spaces I think <coughs> they want, which is a lot. And other corporations that have stayed downtown, like First National, and it's awesome to have them build their tower downtown. It had a lot to do with Bruce Lawrence. And, but every time a corporation comes downtown, we subsidize their parking as taxpayers. Don't go tell anybody this, but um, <laughs> we, as taxpayers, all the parking, it's not, and we have about 43,000 parking spaces downtown. But as a, um, for all those corporate entities like First National, UP, they all have garages that we build as taxpayers, and we, subsidize that about $1,000 per stall per year. So it's a lot of money for, for cars. And everyone thinks they have this right to, you know, for cars to continue driving cars, even though we have great transit service in and out of downtown. So yes, HDR, I think um, over time they'll realize they have too much parking. Um, I'm hoping with um, streetcar that a lot of, the, head of the, the heads of these companies, these small group of people that pay for everything, all the great things we see in Omaha, they'll step up and help fund streetcar, and I think that's where it'll, it'll come from there. They've done this in Minneapolis. There's a group called Tenasca. Is it Tenasca? No, or, forget, there's a, there's a corporate group called uh, up in Minneapolis that got together and basically did a, a study on transit and showed the return on investment and how great it could be for the community, and it has been. Um, so, and they meet annually, or it's annually, uh, semi-annually, and to talk about all these things like we like, like I talked about tonight. I'm hoping more of our corporations in Omaha understand it. One really good example, but it's small, Blue Cross Blue Shield, they first invested in B-Cycle, and B-Cycle's the bike sharing system you see at Exarban and see downtown, they invested it. They were the first ones to invest in, in, in that. Um, I think the older heads of these companies, not so much, but I think when we get down to the next turnover, like when Bruce, Bruce is retired, Bruce Lorenzen, First National, the next guy in line, but the guy in, in line behind him is, is his, his son, Clark Lorenz, and he gets it. He's an advocate for streetcar. So I think with the younger ones, they, they get it, and they'll start to see change. So I think it's just time. The other problem in Omaha, there's not a lot of turnover here. There's not a lot of influx of population like Denver. Denver, they voted many times. They voted a huge sales tax initiative for their light rail, huge sales tax for their football and baseball stadium. It's because it's a lot of transplants. It's new people. Um, to the community, they didn't have a problem paying for it. Um, but yeah, it's it's really, I've been harping on the chamber for years now that transit needs to be more important than it is. Because what you see out there today, especially on I-80, um, I can get to work in 15 minutes. Um, and I, we live on 14th and Center, but that'll be 30 minutes and five years from now, or, or 10 years from now. It's just gonna get worse and worse and worse. And that's my big thing. I'm not, I love bikes and love trains and transit. It's not, it's, that's part of it, but it's also getting more cars off the road and people into other modes of transportation it makes it a lot easier for people to get to go where they're going. Why did General Motors just announce uh, investing in Lyft? I haven't read that story. What, the question was, why is General Motors uh, investing in Lyft? Um, I think they, they see it's, it's the future. I'm not sure how they're investing, if they just put money into them. And so, what's that? And they're doing that too. Um, and Google's investing in, in driverless cars too. Uh, I think they're they're seeing, and one important note, I didn't put it in here, but millennials are they're not buying cars. More and more of them are not buying cars, more and more are not getting their licenses, they're waiting to have kids. Um, and, and GM hired a company to look at um, how they can get millennials to buy cars. So I think it's just, they see the writing on the wall that they need to do something else. And, um, Chrysler, Daimler Chrysler is looking at it too. So I think they're all investing in things that they know that they can. So I don't know if they're going to invest in vehicles so, so people can use their vehicles for Uber and Lyft, but I think they see the writing on the wall. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, you Hi. Well, so my question was how much do you think climate plays a role in our willingness to use mass transit? It doesn't. Um, and people say that about bikes too. Um, and we have two problems in Omaha for bikes and someone in transit is climate and hills. Um, Minneapolis is the most bikeable, friendly community in the country for until it got taken over by New York. Um, and it's worse up there than it is here. Um, and they also have a wonderful transit system, top five in the country. And imagine Minneapolis compared to Chicago and San Francisco and DC. So I think it does have some 
but I think if the system's designed right and the city starts to change around the system, it's not such a big deal. And if you have a great street to walk on, um, you don't care walking a little bit further to, to get to a transit station or stop. I think it's some, but I, and I, in our BRT stations that we're going we're designing right now, we're going to have there'll, there'll be climate control, where there'll be radiant heat either in the ceiling and the floor, or just in the ceiling, um, and be protected from the sun and everything else. But it, it does it does play a role. But there are cities that have horrible climates, and their transit uh, is spectacular. Thank you. Thank you.